And let's get down to business here. Let's get down to the 12 rules for life. If you listen to the show, we've talked about Jordan Peterson before. I'm sure you're familiar with him. I don't think he needs much introduction. Can I just say, there was an article in the LA Times recently uh, about him that that talked about him as being because you guys you know he's the dark professor yeah but he has been referred to as a member of what this article called the intellectual dark web yes did you see this this? this yes this is like uh i think it's dave rubin has self-christened him sam harris jordan peterson and i don't know fucking uh Darkwing Duck, Weinstein, Dung, and, yeah. Yeah, Darkwing Duck, or something. Yeah, wait, Harvey know. Weinstein's on the intellectual dark web. <laughs> Absolutely, wow, yeah. it really is dark. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate it when the FBI Frank from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The thing is, I, I don't know it. if these guys know that the dark web is where like you download child porn and hire <laughs> hitmen and like they're <laughs> identifying their like yeah. intellectual movement with it. I'm glad you brought that up. The intellectual dark web, right? Like, and 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 you know, uh, Molyneux or all these guys, but like Peterson in particular, I think is the perfect avatar of this because it's like, yeah, ooh. This, this, his, he's dark and dangerous. Like these, these, these controversial ideas he's putting out there. Ooh, like he's just too dark and intelligent. The, the fundamental fact about him overall, but all of these guys, is how unbearably tedious and vacuous their actual thoughts and writing are. Okay, let me Far tell you. Far from being uh, dangerous, it's just it's only dangerous if you're trying to fucking stay awake or make sense <laughs> of any of it. I did. I did read the book. And let me tell you, it is basically a combination of like uh, the secret and the bell curve. It's like, <laughs> it's like if you if you're in the market for some self help bullshit with all the kind of narcissism and navel gazing and mysticism that implies, but there wasn't enough social Darwinism in it for you. <laughs> this is the book for you. Don't just respect yourself. Have contempt for others. <laughs> Perfect well, the combo. Contribution it makes. Oh, well, that's that's what I believe in. Yeah. Um, so. To start things off, like my, my the main thing I was curious uh, about this book. It's like a it's a it's a tome. It's a doorstop. This thing, and it's it's a genuine you know hit in the, in the publishing. Yeah, world, it was number know? one on Amazon for a while. Yeah, the well, reviews were raves. I think it, it's a unanimously our, five star rated book. Mm-hmm. Except I wrote a review that was one star uh, that I asked people like if they if they found it helpful to upvote it, and for like a couple of hours it was the the second most helpful review on there it said my man has literally no idea what he's talking about and you were a confirmed purchaser you weren't just i was a confirmed purchaser the, uh... i read the book and uh the jordan peterson fans mounted a campaign to get it taken down yeah so, wow so, can't handle what happened in the marketplace of ideas yeah, yeah. well that's Safe the other space, thing my is, friends. Uh, uh you know i mean of course he is like all these people um embraced and taken up the mantle of uh, free speech and the you know open uh, exchange of ideas and civil society but um both him and his fans are just about the most uh thin-skinned uh, dorks and reactionaries yeah. imaginable who again like if you make fun of peterson or even just discuss him in any way that uh, short of absolute reverence will throw a fit and, uh, you know, again, just take you on the road to pedantry. The speech thing is something they get really, you know, outrageously pedantic about because, like, he, he he's famous because he said he wouldn't call trans students by their preferred pronouns. Mm-hmm. And, like, every time he's pressed on that, he says, I didn't say that. I said I wouldn't call them by any pronouns that were dictated by law. So, like, what the fuck are you going to call them? Like, I mean, he's totally uh willing to obfuscate what he's actually going to say in service of some abstraction well that's a very good i mean this is sort of like uh his his ruse and i think it it speaks to a lot to his popularity in i like for instance in all of these interview clips of his that have sort of gone viral i'm sure you've seen them he genuinely does get the better of the people who are interviewing him most of the time because they're largely unprepared and they had they do the standard sort of liberal thing where they're like you don't really believe this do you I and mean, we've talked about this before and then he does a thing where he just speaks really belligerently and quickly and it, it just sort of like plows right over them he however in like words about statistics that like most people don't know however what like what he does is like there was a like a, a famous one the, the one that a lot of people shared it's like uh i think vice was interviewing him and he was talking about like you know sexual harassment in the workplace and he was making the point that uh, lipstick, when a woman wears lipstick, the point of lipstick and makeup in general in women to like sort of you know brighten, redden the cheeks and lips is uh, to convey sexual arousal. It's meant like they, like they, to convey a sort of exaggerated sexual response. So he's saying like 
when women put on makeup and you know dress up to go to work, they are signaling their sexuality in a way. So we shouldn't we shouldn't lie to ourselves about what's going on there. And then like the interviewer would be like, "We'll just try to pick, like, well, so what does that imply?" And he's like, "Well, I'm not implying anything. I'm just really acknowledging that." But it's just like he's setting up these sort of like thought experiments and statements that would seem to imply that uh, women are asking to be uh, have their asses pinched just because they wear makeup to work. But one could just as easily say, like, when a man wears a suit, like a, a blazered tailored jacket is supposed to make your shoulders look wider and give your upper body a sort of nice sense of symmetry and proportion, which is also sexual signaling. So, I mean, I wasn't going to say anything, Will, but your outfit proves it. <laughs> I mean, I'm dressed like a fucking the, slob the, right your, now. The sweatpants yeah. and the <laughs> yeah. slippers. When, when you wear track pants, you're daring people <laughs> to look at the outline of your dick the same way that it goes in the jungle. Uh <laughs> Just simply, simply, what does the man wear when he comes to the podcast? He puts on a pair of sweatpants where you see exactly how he's been circumcised. <laughs> this kind of gets at his appeal, though, is because he's talking about these taboo subjects, you know, like, and and it's exciting for some of his fans that, like, he's talking about the the sexuality that's, like, lying behind seemingly normal situations. Mm-hmm. And they get excited about that, and but they get, just accept whatever like, like mumbo again, jumbo he in, has. In a and, very vague, general sense, yeah, like yeah. of course that's true. But it's just like, what is he implying here? And the thing is, I don't think he really knows what he's trying to imply. I think his fans like pick up on these little cues that uh, resonate with them because it's like exciting and controversial. But I think he very strenuously tries to avoid the implications of any of this because like I said I, I think he's just incredibly tedious it's just like when you're when you're a kid and like you have a substitute teacher who like uses mild swear words and you're like wow this guy's cool he said what the hell you're like that's basically uh, how these guys are responding to him is this kind of like paternal authority figure who's a little on the edge well for like a lot of reactionaries in the past like few years I'd say you can really rip shit up and like get an audience by pointing out how shitty the modern world is. It's fucking terrible. Like most people that listen to you aren't happy. They're completely unfulfilled by their existences. They have no fulfilling relationships in their life. But for most of them, like for a lot of the alt right guys, it's like they'll string them along and be like, Hey, doesn't Mark Zuckerberg suck? Doesn't this suck? Isn't it fucking stupid that, uh, the only Avenue of politics is like this sort of, cultural consumption in which Marvel movie you see. Isn't this fucking stupid and tawdry? Don't you hate your life? And then they sort of like lose people because every time they all meet up, they look stupid and kill somebody. <laughs> or you talk to them long enough, they're like, and the thing that we do about it is we blow up a Home Depot parking lot. <laughs> but with Jordan Peterson, it's that he just goes into this sort of Sam Harris uh, sort of so Evo psych bullshit. Did and it's, see- not, it's, not that, it's not that his fans are like super interested in what he has to say after he points out how shitty modern life is it's just that you know it, it sounds like something that's smart and they're mostly hooked by like yeah well, my th- life is shitty i think what what hooks them also is it's one it's step one is you identify discontent and that is where a lot of these small less successful reactionary quote-unquote thinkers stall out is because at, they really only have a, a spurious diagnosis he has an action item and it is just self help. It's just yeah. mm-hmm. it's just take control of your life, Bucko, because the life of a sort of underemployed, relatively economically stable middle class young person is one with basically no supervision, no structure, and that allows you to basically do a thing like game until you wet yourself. Because no one will stop you from doing that in le- except for yourself. And he is acknowledging that and saying you have to be the one to actually intervene in your own life. And that is that's incredibly powerful, either because people literally don't get parented anymore. Like parents don't talk to kid their children about about these kind of things or people grow up so wedded to the, the rhetoric and communication styles of the Internet that nothing is real until they see it online. So their par- their parents can tell them to clean their room all week, and it's just going to go over <laughs> their head. But when their YouTube friends tell them to clean their room, it actually resonates. I'm not sure which it is. I'm not one of these guys. So there was that uh, the most famous interview he did was uh, the one on the BBC with Kathy Newman, and there was that part when I think she said something about how like, well, you know, most uh, Fortune 500 CEOs are men. It's very exclusionary. There aren't a lot of women on there. And he said something like, well, yeah. Most men aren't Fortune 500 CEOs either. 
And like, that's true. And if you're not going to be able to like offer a critique of a, a structure that has extremely wealthy people and extremely, uh, you know, disadvantaged people, you're going to get caught in places like that. Yeah. You know? Well, that's, that's, why that's why he that, seems why... so, you know, like he's the reasonable one. That's you know? why he's not going to go away is because the other. So like, yeah, there are two main like dominant cultural forces, like the reactionary one and the liberal one. The liberal one can't point to the world, the culture it's created and go, uh, actually, you love it. It's great. <laughs> they just can't. America is already great. So, dude, Jordan Peterson is going to be around like forever until I don't know. He starts a cult or he he finally does like uh, he intersects a mass suicide with Haley's Comet at the right time. I don't know. But yeah, he's not going away because they have no answer to him because, because he offers a structural critique and it's wrong, but it is and it's it's gibberish at its heart, but it is one that seeks to offer an explanation and there and all cultural con conversation on the broad on the mainstream is not comprehensive you it's just individual think pieces right and individual reactions to specific discrete events and all coming from this sort of vague cultural liberalism and and, and w- which really just it has nothing to offer other than the status quo is basically good we could use some more diversity but nothing that actually r- speaks to anyone's real discontent on any level other than like not seeing enough representation and in think, art or something. And I think what Peterson does is, like you said, we, we, we hooks him because like uh, we hooks, he hooks the, the marks as we've described earlier. But I think and then what, what he offers is this kind of Jungian psychoanalytical thing trick where it's just like you can with this knowledge that I'm going to impart to you you can recreate yourself as sort of a character in your own heroic narrative yeah. it, 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 that, that connects with these subconscious, ancient, sort of almost biological truths yes. about humanity. And this is where it gets into the reactionary part is because all of these truths that you know Peterson thinks is unchanging, absolutely true and any attempt to alter or go outside of them will lead to disaster are all things like you know uh just hierarchy is natural right the traditional family is natural and like like these are like we need to hew to these things that are all true because they've been true throughout all of human civilization this is something that actually like he uh feuded with sam harris about because you know sam harris's fans all like requested that he get jordan peterson on his podcast you know like Want my two dads to talk, my my Islamophobic dad, my transphobic dad. And uh, so he he went on and he just said a bunch of gibberish about archetypes and the collective unconscious. And Sam Harris was like, what the fuck are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. And everyone was disappointed. And they had this email exchange where Peterson was like talking about slaying dragons and shit. Yeah, yeah. He really loves... He loves the slaying the dragon. Well, that's the thing. Is and, that and, and, and I these sort of, guys, like the Paris fans, liking Peterson, how many, I want to know, what percentage of these Peterson fans are guys who, until Peterson showed up, would have considered themselves guys who like were loved logic and reason and thought that those were the ways that you figure out the world. And then this guy shows up with the dragons and the fucking subconscious and this Yuki and stuff. Yeah. And they're like, fuck me up, buddy. And it, <laughs> it, what it shows is that what they really don't, they don't really care about logic or reason. Yeah. These are just a totem because they want to justify traditional hierarchies because they think they belong on the top of them. They think they aren't on the top because uh, evil cultural Marxists have interceded with, with the truth, changed the culture, undermined their rightful place, and they want to get back on the rightful place. The same way that like the ancient regime before the French Revolution was was had a natural order. They feel the same way, but the 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 Enlightenment came along, cut all those heads off, and we don't think in terms of divine rule anymore. So we need something to replace the divine right with, and it can only be in a modern context. So it's got to be reason and logic. But if another guy comes along and he has the same hierarchy to defend, and but he does a more a, a, a more sparkling job of it, and he's talking about dragons and archetypes. I'll take that. Whatever it is, whatever can justify the hierarchy is what matters. Uh, Matt, you know who else had a natural order? Lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> I want to get into this now because, like, the book is called Twelve Rules for Life," and ever since it came out, it's like all I want to know: what are the twelve rules? I've actually found someone who who just has done all twelve. I forgot rules. all of them. Okay. 
I'm hoping your since, life must since, be since, fucked up, man. Since you read your house the book. is burning down, your house would still be yeah, up there shit. if you followed them. <laughs> rule, <I'm> a- <laughs> rule number one: never finish a bottle of water. <laughs> If you have water out in your home, if there's a fire, you can put it out quickly. This is a this is a real quote from Peterson's first book, uh, Maps of Meaning. Mm. Chaos. That's my favorite Halo combat of all. <laughs> Do the voice well. Chaos is what extends eternally and without limit beyond the boundaries of all states, all ideas, and all disciplines. It's the foreigner. The stranger, the member of another gang, the rustle in the bushes, the hidden anger of your mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then he goes, okay, order, order. Uh, no, he goes, chaos is symbolically associated with the feminine. Order, by contrast, is explored territory. That's the hundreds of millions of years of hierarchy of place, position, and authority. That's the structure of society. And this is again all this dragon bullshit. Well, so I'm just going to say here, chaos is the fire that burns down Shuja's house. That's Order right. is the Porg in Virgil's. And the water, yeah. <laughs> Listen, here's the way he puts that in the new book, uh, which which is full of like that that type of stuff about you know the, the balance of order and chaos in the world. Uh, he says, Order and chaos are the yang and yin of the famous Taoist symbol. <laughs> Two serpents head to tail. Order is the white masculine serpent. Chaos, its black feminine counterpart. <laughs> what? Now, what, what I, serpents? You, are, I don't. You, I don't think you've got to be a Freudian to look at <laughs> white masculine serpent and draw some kind of conclusion about <laughs> what he's motivated. This is, oh, yeah, this is logical and reasonable. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. This is a. This is logic. <laughs> this by, is reason. By the way, check out my new website, whited.com. <laughs> <laughs> new collaboration with Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Well, We're logical men. Look at look at the okay. black women Shuja, of chaos. Have you seen this? Look at the fucking diagrams oh, that I've are in him. his first book. It's like literally Henry There's the fucking yeah, it's Henry right Darger. Darger. It's Henry Darger <laughs> yeah. shit. This is like the diary of a madman, where it's just like you're just like linking all these things. This circle represents the kingdom of order. This circle represents the dragon of chaos. Between it is masculine and female truth, belief, energies. It's like. <laughs> That's re- oh, yeah. oh, these, oh, I are, fucking love logic and reason. These are, these are like this those, is the enlightenment. These are like those hotep memes where it's like sex, sex, spirituality, energy exchange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like two people fucking, but they're writing books on each this other. This motherfucker right? claims that he is defending the lo- the enlightenment tradition with this shit. He keeps saying that they're, that the cultural neo Marxists are undermining the enlightenment. And this is what he, this is what he is calling the Enlightenment is this insane gibberish from his head about about the the chaotic female. Uh, I don't know if he could define vagina. the Enlightenment. Like, no. I, I, he has no idea what these philosophical schools that he's constantly referring to no. actually are. Who was part of them? What they what they represent? Uh, the Enlightenment was. You know, I've only I've never studied modern European history. Only watch YouTube. The Enlightenment was a time when uh, all the guys of Europe, all our old friends, you know, George Washington, uh, uh, Francis Epic Bacon, all of them got together and they said, "Why don't we have an exchange of free speech and logic called YouTube, which has been around for three hundred years?" Well, what it was, what the Enlightenment was, was people using logic and reason and, and observable reality to challenge an unjust hierarchy, the, the society of order, and saying that this, doesn't, this shouldn't exist, and being answered by, no, it's always been, and God has ordained it. And now this guy, under the guise of that Enlightenment, because it is such a penetrating and powerful idea that has persisted in the West for the, the, since its inception... He's going to use that term to defend that same fucking hierarchy, and he's just replaced, you know, Hobbes's uh, divine, uh, you know, constituted go- uh, god king with a serpent sucking its own dick. Uh, I just want to, I want to, I want to include this part. Uh, shout out to uh, Nathan Robinson who did a great uh, takedown of Peterson recently in This Week in Current Affairs. Uh, this was amazing, though. In uh, in Peterson's first book, he includes an epigraph that is a letter to his father. And I'm just going to read this here. I don't know, Dad, but I think I've discovered something that no one else has any idea about, and I'm not sure I can do it justice. Its scope is so broad. Okay, you know how so often you jerk off with your right hand? What if you put your left hand upside down? I sat, I sat on my hand, and it was like I didn't know it. It was like it was a stranger. 
It was chaos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, its scope is so broad that I can see only parts of it clearly at one time, and it is exceedingly difficult to set down comprehensively in writing. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Anyways, I'm glad you and mom are doing well. Thank you for doing my income tax returns. <laughs> oh, cut. Income taxes are easy, you professor bitch. Now I'm, I didn't used to give a shit about was, this guy. Now I'm mad. I was going to say, I have some rules for you. You have to keep, you don't do online banking. It's easier than any time in human history to keep track of your expenses, bucko. Felix, I was, when, I, when I read his letter to his dad, like, this struck me as sort of like a miniaturized version of the 8,000 page Nausgaard novel. Yeah. Uh, where it's just a letter to my father. Guy, he's such a poor man's Nausgaard. <laughs> Nausgaard, Nausgaard, um, his book about cleaning his room, that's just one book in a 50, 50 volume entry about his first 12 years on this That planet. letter honestly sounded like an excerpt from Confederacy of Dunstan. <laughs> that's some yeah, ambitious yeah, 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 yeah. Jay Riley shit. I'm on the edge of something, mother. Father, I'm on the edge of something. It's, I can't even comprehend it. I'm edging, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I keep talking about the rules. I want to know. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. I want to go through these new rule. Okay. These are Pe- <laughs> two, these are these are Jordan Peterson's twelve new rules to fight the chaos. Fight the chaos. Fight the chaos, which he has said is female. He is telling his legion of incel <laughs> dork fans that women are terrifying other that must be tamed. But that's oh, logic and reason. Homeboy. That's not a, a fucking graph that he made with human shit on the side of a wall. You can tell from lipstick. Yep. No, but, you homeboy, to home, you need to put your finger on and above the G spot, play the clip like a swizzle stick flute, and you need to give chaos a triple digit orgasm. Matt, now, now you say that that like he's he's representing the, the feminine represents like the dark bottomless abyss of chaos, and me, men represent the light of reason and order. And you would say, well, that's a fairly misogynist, like pseudo philosophical drivel. And then I think he would say he would point out that no, you misunderstand me. I'm saying we need order and chaos. But he wants it's to about, fight it, though. It's about the synthesis. It says of fight, both. though. <laughs> well, let's fight. hear these rules, he's, man. He's not saying synthesize the chaos. Well, fight know, the chaos. Sometimes, sometimes. The word is fight. That, that <laughs> fucking uh, Marcus Lapon guy, he knew okay. how to fight the chaos. Right. So I keep delaying this. Here are the 12 rules. Rule number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Okay. Shuji, can you, can you, do you remember this and can you explain this one? Okay. For one thing, the role model he wants you to emulate when you stand up straight with your shoulders back is literally lobsters. Yeah. Uh, this is, they the, don't the, do, this they is don't. a famous, this is his famous But they mascot. don't have, le- they don't it's stand up at like all. It's not like Paul Bunyan or you're something. Pedantic, it's but, they don't, but they don't stand up you're, though. You're being pedantic. No, they, he, they don't have okay, legs listen, as we would imagine. I, 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 I actually, I've, I've, bookmarked a uh, 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 an excerpt in my dog-eared copy of the book here uh, where he talks about the lobsters that I can just read to you what he says. Yep. Yes, please share. Okay, lobsters have more in common with you than you might think, <laughs> particularly when you are feeling crabby. Ha ha. That's not, that is Whoa. not a pun. You. That sucks so bad. <laughs> They're not even. That's not even the right animal. Uh, oh. Lobsters that's live. Terrible. <laughs> lobsters live on the ocean floor. Just they like need, you. They need a home base down there, a range within which they hunt for prey and scavenge around for stray edible bits and pieces of Just whatever like rains me. down from the continual chaos of carnage and death far above. Is this that's, about Virgil's sounds, apartment again? <laughs> that they, want, right. they want somewhere secure where the hunting and gathering is good. They want a home. So this, this can, is a debate. This is a basement when your mom is hucking uh, beef right, jerky down. You're just down trying to right, play you know. video games yeah. and the carnage of mom and dad upstairs. Yeah, ordering uh, chaos, in, in, fighting in each other. Hey, when ordering bedroom. chaos, fight yeah. each other. Why? I have to spend weekends wrestling mom. I have to. I have to spend weekends with order. It kind of sucks. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, oh, this guy's boy. actually a genius because you know what they call lobster cages, bedrooms. Oh, really? Shit. Yes. Why do they yeah. call? Yeah. All right. Well, listen. This can present a problem since there are many lobsters. What if two of them occupy the same territory at the bottom of the ocean at the same time and both want to live there? What if there are hundreds of lobsters all trying to make a living and raise a family living? in the same what? crowded patch? He's thinking of SpongeBob. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, well, yeah, you know, my man <laughs> loves cartoons. He's just yeah. doing SpongeBob yeah, memes. Fucking lobster goes to work every day. Yeah. Clocks in, clocks out. All right. Other creatures have this problem, too. When songbirds come north in the spring, for example, they engage in ferocious territorial disputes. The songs they sing, so peaceful and beautiful to human ears, 
are siren calls and cries of domination. A brilliantly musical <laughs> bird a is a small warrior proclaiming his sovereignty. I'm so sick of these birds that only sing about bitches and hoes. <laughs> So listen, what happens next in the book is that he tells this story about uh, how when he was a kid, he got a tape recorder and he made a recording of a songbird and then he played it back to the songbird and the songbird attacked him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen. It's like fucking Kez. Oh my okay, God. So then he, then he brings it back around. Now, wrens and lobsters are very different. Lobsters do not fly, sing, or perch in trees. Whoa. Uh, whoa citation whoa. needed, motherfucker. No, I'm sorry. Suja, Suja, we have, we, we have to censor this guy. This is too dangerous. <laughs> this is more important than the First Amendment. We've got to stop this book from being read. Wrens have feathers, not hard shells. Wrens can't breathe underwater and are seldom I've served. tried to make them. <laughs> <laughs> and they are seldom served with butter. However, they are also similar in important ways. Both are obsessed with status and position, for example, like a great many creatures. The Norwegian zoologist and comparative psychologist, and I can't say this guy's fucking name, observed Just call back, him Nausgaard. Yeah, it's Nausgaard. Every man, Carl, Carl every man in Norway is Nausgaard, yeah. As Carl Knausgaard said back in 1921, even common barnyard chickens establish a pecking order. Listen. The determination of who's who in the chicken world has important implications for each individual bird's survival, particularly in times of scarcity. The birds that always have priority to access to whatever food is sprinkled out in the yard in the morning are the celebrity chickens. After them come the second stringers, the haggers on, and the wannabes. Then the third-rate chickens have their turn, and so on, down to the bedraggled, partially feathered, and badly pecked wretches who occupy the lowest, untouchable stratum of the chicken hierarchy. Those guys are such Man, where would the lobsters go? What the fuck? Okay, what he's doing here is he's employing... Uh, He's having a stroke. He, he, he's, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget when chaos, I mean mother, stopped me from testing wrens breathing underwater. This is, this is postmodern. Yeah, okay. What he's doing here with, with all the lobster and chicken shit is what, what he's doing is he's saying in nature there are these fairly ruthless hierarchies uh, that govern you know, who passes on their genes and is sorted out largely through you know, violence and domination and things like that. And he's extrapolating from that that like essentially that is the natural way of things and human society, you know, like you should be like the victorious lobster because he, the lobster gets physically bigger and struts about when he has cleared his little lobster warren. For this is kind of a downer of a point, but like his lowest stratum of chicken society, he literally calls untouchables, yeah, which are like literally a cast of yes. people in India, yeah. who are severely oppressed. Well, they have it coming He's, again. They, they got outpecked, bedraggled, and partially yeah. feathered. Well, I, I, again, I mean, like, even, the, the, even the, if you want to pick fucking birds, there's just a, a new study out about how ravens survive through a very complicated system of cooperation rewards. Based a, a reward system based on cooperating with one the another. The thing is, Matt, we shouldn't even have to talk about the fucking birds, really, you know? Yes. Like, because we're human <laughs> beings! Just, yeah. Because we're social animals that fucking have the power of speech and have created civilizations! But again, like, this works because it's true in a very banal sense that, you know, all animal species, including Homo sapiens, are, you know, they, they, they are governed by these kind of, like, nasty, you know, un, un irrational, darker impulses, and we sort ourselves into these pecking orders in human nature. However, the fallacy is that, like, that that's because it exists that it's good and human, and human civilization or society is inalterable and as a result. And inevitable, And yeah. that's inevitable, right? And again, of course, you could do the opposite it and pick out any number of animal behaviors that are completely alien from human beings and be like, oh, we should emulate that as well. Yeah, we you should know? be like bonobos and just stick our dicks in each other's faces <laughs> whenever we have a conflict. <laughs> so that okay, so that's basically the point he's making about lobsters is that like you got to you got to be confident. Posture. You got to you got to have alpha posture. Alpha posture. Sort of project Don't let confidence. anybody take your space on the ocean floor. <laughs> and if somebody plays back a recording of you, your <laughs> face attack that fucker. And but he was when he's saying stand up straight with your shoulders back, he means like you know as a young man like. Uh, the the more defeated you are psychologically, like you will reflect that physically and sort of like close your body language up and sort of hunch over. And if you just sort of projected more physical confidence, you would feel more confident. Generally, See, and the thing is, he, that's true. Yeah, and that's a perfect example of his whole deal. He has an actually useful, if kind of obvious, <laughs> piece of advice for you know your slumped over basement dweller that might not even have thought about posture before this. 
and he smuggles into it a bunch of insane social Darwinism. Yep. At the same time. That's the formula. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, does he do like a version of the uh, Virgin and Chad meme, but with like a bunch of insane circles all over <laughs> it? <It's> like, <laughs> Mother chaos. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The Chad is order. Rule number two. Treat yourself like you would someone you are responsible for helping. Okay, I mean that's just nice, you know. That's yeah. just like a that's like a, a you know a good attitude to have. Yeah, that's like uh, self care. This that's is just, this is yeah. This is like the guys who like who like they turn thirty five and they're like, oh my god, I did thirty two hits of acid, and I realized that when you're nice to people, they'll be nice to you. <laughs> oh my god, it was like God was talking to me. I mean, the thing is, he's he's a he's a psychologist, so he does like you know do therapy with people. So, you know, half of what he says is just really basic ways for people not to hate themselves and hate their lives. And he's just like, let me just throw some uh, what is, is he smug- racism in there. <laughs> All right. Rule number three. Make friends with people who want the best for you. That's like literally your friends. That kind of is a defining character. Okay, I, 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 has- I, I, I will only befriend people who want to see me die. I, it always keeps me on my toes, keeps me ready. But what, yo, what yo, else yo. is a friend if not nah, a person? Nah, yo, I keep my circle small. Yo. Only yeah. eat with a few, laugh uh, with many. Yo, fuck, yo, <laughs> fuck, fuck, fuck G-Jack. I want to see the Peterson versus Amiri King. Amiri King. King. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah, 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 yeah. Don't make friends with anybody. Yeah. Friends are for yeah. bitches. I'm not even friends with my fucking wife. <laughs> I'm not friends with myself. <laughs> There's a there's an anecdote he tells in here uh, at that part about how he like a childhood friend of his came over to his house and he brought a friend of his. Oh, I heard about this. Yeah. It, OK, he says it was his friend. I really remember he was spaced. He was baked. He was stoned out of his gourd. His head and our nice civilized apartment up on goofballs did not occupy did not easily occupy the same universe. And then, yeah, he just goes on about how uh, pissed off he was that this guy was in his apartment. And then he takes his friend aside and says, you need to leave and take this useless bastard with you (laughs) or something like that. So this is his attitude towards friendship. No, no stoners in my house. (laughs) Okay. Rule number four. Compare yourself with who you were yesterday, not with who someone else is today. So that's sort of like he, he he's getting into this uh, eat pray love. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I think I might see my, that's fine. Like, I, I mean, you know, it's fine to say like don't beat yourself up by comparing yourself to others, but he he's he's spins that out into this extreme individualism, right? That not only should you not compare yourself to others, you should cut yourself off from others. You should you know uh, kind of elevate yourself above others, like the first chapter. Wow, I, I can't. Why would young white men who've been conditioned to think that because they know a lot of things about Star Wars? And are good at video games are the natural rulers of the earth. Why would they would appreciate someone telling them that they should cultivate a delusional sense of self superiority that doesn't have to come into unseemly contact with other humans that might disabuse them of it? Again, this rule here is just like very basic, like boring, uh, you know, life advice. However, I can imagine where he's going to go with this is extrapolating it to the political sphere, which is like, I think I've read him say things like, you know, uh, socialism is not about loving the poor, it's about hating the rich. And that like, it's this idea that it's envy that makes people, you know, advocate for a more just society or a more adequate uh, distribution of resources. Yeah, he's constantly saying like, don't blame capitalism, don't blame society. Well, you know, what should you even... uh, uh, What, blame Frozen? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. The thing. It's like yeah. you don't want to blame. It's like okay, capitalism isn't the problem. To then fill the space of well, okay, how come everything sucks so bad? With well, a bunch of uh, a bunch of French postmodernists got together and changed the content of Disney movies. I mean, yeah, it's, a yes, reflection, yes. it's a reflection of like the most uh, kind of foundational neoconservative uh, neoliberal idea uh, that there is no society, as yeah. Margaret Thatcher put it. Like he, he's uh, calling on you not to even consider yourself as belonging to a community. Well, you're a lobster on the bottom of the well, ocean. I, yeah, I think I think Matt, you made the the absolute correct observation here is that like he's he's critiquing 
the sort of activists and people who want to change the world. And this gets into rule number six. I'm going to skip ahead one because I want to talk about it. He says, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And I think the point you get exactly right is he's like, don't criticize capitalism. Don't criticize, you know, injustice. Criticize um, cartoons that aren't as good as they used to be. Yeah. Like that really is what he's interested in. The new in. Laura Cross tits aren't big enough. <laughs> so, but the set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Again, there's like, a half truth there that I think is applicable or even a okay criticism of the left. Like, you know, maybe sort your own shit out before you try to take on all the problems of the world. But when he says, set your house in perfect order, and then he will say that, of course, people are always imperfect, so then never try. Yeah. So it's this constantly receding horizon of things that you can or shouldn't do. And he says, I, I read something about him where he said, like, uh, the 60s were really bad because they just gave everyone the idea that, like, if you carried a placard, like, you should have something to say, even though you've never been financially independent and you're only a student or whatever. And my answer to that is, like, you know, how much small business experience should I have to have before I can say the Vietnam War was a fucking <laughs> atrocity? Like, or that segregation is bad and should be confronted I mean, uh, criticizing someone else's house isn't the only thing you can do. You can also help people set their house in order. Some people don't have a house. You know, the, the, the only way he can think about it is we're in these autonomous spheres and we can be critical of each other. Yeah, that's all we can do. We yeah. can't build solidarity. It doesn't exist. Okay. I'm going back one rule now. Rule number five yeah. is do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. <laughs> this is actually my favorite rule. Yeah, I you, mean, do you remember what that was about? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a parent, so I don't have a personal relationship to this idea. But how to like uh, raise your kids? Isn't this and, the chapter where he fantasized about beating up a small child at a playground? Oh yeah, he has a story about how he was at a playground and there was an obnoxious child who was causing a shenanigans and. He had a fantasy of like kicking the shit out of the kid and and then thought, I, I wish I could do that. And since I can't, this kid's going to grow up to be <laughs> okay. an There's ass. Okay, I, 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 right. yeah. I, I have the excerpt right yeah. here. He says, I remember taking my daughter to the playground once when she was about two. She was playing on the monkey bars hanging in midair. A particularly provocative little monster of about the same age was standing above her on the two same bar old. she was two gripping. I watched him move towards her, our eyes locked. He slowly and deliberately stepped on her hands with increasing force over and over as he stared me down. Well, he's being dominant. <laughs> he's being dominant. That's an alpha move. Standing up That's an alpha move. Yeah, yeah. what what's wrong with that? He's, she's in the space that he's supposed to occupy. That's his part of the ocean floor. That's the ocean floor. He's being a lobster. You should high five his little <laughs> ass. Second. I just love the idea that they locked eyes and he's being stared <laughs> down by a two-year-old. <laughs> and he goes... um, uh, he goes. Um, he knew exactly what he was doing. Up yours, Daddy O. That was his philosophy. Oh, <laughs> his philosophy. God. Two years old. Two years old. <laughs> also have a philosophy. Can I just say what is it with his his like rockabilly slang? <laughs> yeah, this is a good. Yeah, this two is, year old olds do not have philosophy. <laughs> they don't even have bowel control. He had already concluded that adults were contemptible and that he could safely defy them. Again, he hasn't concluded anything. Yeah, you don't have not, thoughts. He's has two years old. Like a three-word vocabulary. <laughs> he, I love that this two-year-old has like done the calculation and be like, I, I think it's pretty safe that I could defy these adults yeah. around me. I, I, very little will happen to me as yeah, a result. I, I never I've weighed the consequences. You stepped on the face. Hey, Dr. Peterson, uh, let's uh, have a discussion about uh, the nature of myth. He steps on her face. Fingers and looks at him and goes, you're witnessing a great becoming. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, um, uh, he already concluded that adults are contemptible and that he could safely defy that. Too bad then that he was destined to become one. That was the hopeless future. Yeah, his bitch, you're going to grow <laughs> up. Got your ass. <laughs> that was the hopeless future his parents had saddled him with. What, to, to grow up? In two years. <laughs> I, 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 give, I give my child anti-aging anti -aging serum. They've been two years old for three decades. <laughs> to his great and salutary shock, I picked him bodily off the playground structure and threw him 30 feet down the field. <laughs> Wait, I think... Wait, he just punted this kid. Yes, 30 well, he's, a man, he's fantasizing. <laughs> okay, about it. okay, fantasizing. which is totally normal and cool. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I didn't. Oh, he goes. No, I didn't. I just took my daughter somewhere else. But it would have been better for him if I had. Oh, it would have yeah, been better yeah, like yeah. killing him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would have been. You know better what? I was a little piece of shit who had no all contempt for humans until a stranger in a public park <laughs> threw me across a playground. <laughs> 
And then my life was great after that. Yeah. How many life stories include a violent inner interaction with an adult when you're a small child and then things just getting great from that, that, that point? That two-year-old was the dragon and Peterson was uh, St. Uh, George. George. Yeah. Yeah. And when a baby was also disrespectful and Peterson just used his thumb to press down on the soft spot on the top of his head <laughs> like a fucking <laughs> like a like a video game he was also uh conquering chaos he was about the size of a cooper and i just jumped on his head and the, the coins of honor and discipline came out of his body i gotta, I gotta right. play ground power One thing i remember about this chapter is there's a section called discipline and punish which is literally the name of yeah. michel foucault's his, his, book, his beth noir which i think he doesn't like, he probably doesn't even know that well he hates Foucault, right? Yeah, he hates Foucault and Derrida, who he says are Marxists and who he believes what? essentially controlled the uh, the the way the whole world uh, uh, proceeded after the 1970s. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Is a cabal of French postmodern theorists with a combined income of like uh, what sixty five thousand francs a year, who wrote books most undergraduates don't even read when yeah. they get assigned them. Yeah. It's yeah. like you want to fucking talk about Matt. logic and reason. <laughs> What is a more plausible explanation for the course of matches of, through a screwdriver of civilization yeah. <laughs> of the last 30 years? The vagaries of global capitalism, i.e. the forces that control the production of everything that we consume and interact with, yeah, or a handful of French assholes going to some colleges that most people don't go to, changing the content of Disney films and turning us all into... Uh, these horrible the thing is, no, no, dude, he didn't make up this theory either like it comes from like uh, these neoconservative think tanks uh, who blamed cultural Marxists this is like the Frankfurt, the Frankfurt School, School theory right when they said cultural Marxists they meant Jews, Jews. but you know they had this whole conspiracy theory about how uh, Marxism got turned into identity politics which then took over the world Jonathan Chait believes this yes he does. Uh, yeah. among other people and Peterson just adds, adds this thing where he turns Marxism into postmodernism even though most Marxists will tell you they hate postmodernism and people who, uh, I don't know a single person who calls himself a postmodernist, yeah. but people who are into contemporary theory are often very antagonistic towards Marxism. Yeah. And, and people who try well, to reconcile them are yeah, few Marx and far got between. driven out of the academy 30 fucking years ago. You can't get a Marxist interpretation of anything. Uh, but what, what, the reason that this is even surface level plausible to people is because the neoliberal turn happened simultaneously with the liberation of minorities and women in the West. And those two things sort of, one of them kind of cloaked the other one. And so people can point to the problem and say, well, look what happened once we got rid of these hierarchies, as opposed to look what happened when, you know, the uh, Western capitalism went into prolonged crisis and it was restructured in a way that radically uh, destroyed labor power and atomized uh, communities and deindustrialized and, and scattered everybody to the fucking four winds and turned yeah. them into uh, eternally precarious subjects who who's, uh, had no real economic security, no ability to pass on long term uh, security to their children. That, that is masked by the fact that, well, yeah, but now there's more women uh, in movies and black people on TV. Well, a lot of this is coming from uh, people in the center, uh, the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, rewriting that history to the point that, like, you know, uh, the, the Black Panther Party was a think tank, hmm. you know, <laughs> like they, they, they're, yeah. they're turning these very radical movements uh, against racism, uh, for feminism, for, uh, you know, sexual liberation into just kind of, you know, uh, electoral policy driven, uh, you know, uh, democratic goals. The Black, Black Panther Party is not a think tank, it is a movie studio putting out some amazing films that we're all very proud of right now. Henry, Henry, I want a list of every fucking Jew that works at Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> All the Incredibles are Jews. They changed their name when they got to Ellis Island. Um, uh, he would actually like no, the, the Incredibles. Incredibles. Oh, I'm sure he loves it. Yeah, yeah. Lo I'm sure he loves it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The movie yeah. he really hates is Frozen. Hates Frozen. He hates Frozen. Oh, Has anyone here seen Frozen? No. I have not seen Frozen. Oh, Chris, Chris you've seen Frozen? Frozen? Yeah. Okay, is I, what, what do you hates about... Uh, propaganda? Oh, well, what he hates about... <laughs> Post structuralist, right? It's what? But he ha he hates it because it's sort of like a revisionist fairy tale in that like the message of the movie is that like the princess doesn't need a prince to to save her or become self actualized or something. Yeah, there's that fucking song about how there is nothing outside the text and gender is constructed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Well, that's the funny thing is that he's like, yeah, this is this is a this is a departure from the classic tradition of these ancient folk tales, but it's a Hans Christian Andersen thing as much as a mermaid <laughs> right, is. Right. He, he, he doesn't just know gets, that. He gets so much shit just plain wrong. Yeah. Historical facts, sources, citations. I mean, academically, the guy is a, is a total uh, charlatan. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's do rule number seven and rule number eight. I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. All right. Rule number seven, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Whatever. Okay, okay good luck <laughs> yeah, with that. All right. Rule number eight. We've, oh. all, we've all wrapped up that finding meaning thing in a bow. We can do that. <laughs> rule, number Check eight, that off. rule number eight, tell the truth, or at least don't lie. Um, all right. Okay. Again, like I mean, just cool. again, all these right. are like just incredibly pompous ways of restating like incredibly bland, you know, boring yeah. truisms. Um, okay. Rule number nine: Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. That is something he does not do. <laughs> no. That is something I have never seen him do. Yeah, yeah. It's full contempt for anybody who is not on the same on board with this and his fucking fans now are in this thing where they think he's such a goddamn genius and i'm honestly convinced that it's mostly because we don't teach humanities to kids anymore this is the first time they're encountering this stuff like i think that they i think a large percentage of his fans they think he came up with all this archetype shit like they don't know who <laughs> carl jung is you know they don't even know joseph campbell so they think that he is just like i got i went in my room for a while and when I came out, I had these charts like Doc Brown and Dad, the capacity. Dad, I've got an idea. Yeah, you know, and they, they don't realize that he's just regurgitating this sort of this like this relatively uh, well trod territory yeah. of 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 uh, m- frankly discredited psychological concepts. Uh, rule <clears throat> rule number ten: Be precise in your speech. Now, this is the rule that uh, Mr. Peterson probably could use to bone up on. That's the thing. Is is that like uh, he has this rule: be precise in your speech. But every time you're critical of of anything he says, his fans are like, "Well, you gotta watch, uh, you know, uh, uh, ten thousand hours right, of his that's videos what I'm before they're now in a situation before you can legitimately where they think he's him. such a fucking genius that anybody who has a critique that they can't answer." They assume, well, it's in there. It's in one of the things he has said because he has the whole corpus of knowledge. So it's your responsibility <laughs> if you're going to criticize him to engage all of it. You're not. You're not. You're not qualified to talk about him unless you have absorbed his entire. And you know what? I'm sorry if it's transparent gibberish. What kind of what of violence am I doing to myself to 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 subject myself to something? There was this video that was making the rounds the other day online of uh, him summarizing a scene from Pinocchio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the scene was literally one minute long, and he yeah. spent two minutes summarizing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about like the the mythic archetype stuff because at the end of the day, I think really what he's interested in is cartoons. <laughs> that's what he loves talking about cartoons. Well, yeah, he's, he is, and reading meat. And these are his maps of meaning. He's a cartoons. canon pedant. Yeah, that's all he is. He has an idea of what a fairy tale is that he thinks is is eternal and truthful, very logical and reasonable stuff. <laughs> and he thinks anything that comports to it is good, and anything that goes away from it is bad. Anything that goes away from it is doing so because it has a political agenda that is not truly artistic. The only way to be truly artistic is to replicate the same fucking tropes that have existed for a thousand. I, there's another video where he's just listing Disney movies, and he goes, Rudy and the Beast, great. They, they really nailed it. Uh, Little Mermaid, nailed it. Lion King, uh, some problems, but nailed it. And, and <laughs> I wonder what like, the problems he's, he's were. Just def- he's grading them, basically, on how they conform to his idea of the this canonical fairy tale he, motif. So he's just a fucking, he's just a canon nerd at the Cal- end of the day. Cal Lou is an awful little child who I would headshot. With no second thoughts. I'd headshot I agree with you, Mr. Peterson. Yeah. He's like uh, he's like Greg Turkington's character on On Cinema. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just loves it. He's like, you know, uh, you know, uh, Hercules, surprisingly underrated. Five bags of popcorn. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Shrek, lots of great things in there for adults and kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a. Uh, this is great. Speaking of cartoons, he has he has a take on The Simpsons. This was again. Right, we've, been, th- we've been having fun, but I swear to fucking <laughs> Let's God, get dude. Serious yeah, this is second. a serious shit. Let's I don't serious. give a fuck about this fucking is, this God. Is, this is, Ro- I care about the fucking Simpsons. <laughs> Nathan Robinson picked this uh, corn kernel out of the shit pile, so shout outs to him again. This is this is his take on uh, the Simpsons. Without Nelson, king of the bullies, the, the school. He was not king of the fucking bullies. 
All right, now I'm mad. I never really given a shit about this guy. Now I'm mad. Nelson is clearly a several rungs below Dolph Kearney. And Dolph Jimbo. Kearney and Jimbo are the trail. Those call ships really lifted the nation. Now, now we're, after we're being the pedants. Now we're yeah, being Do- the Doctor Peterson. Pedants. There is only one reactionary respect. His name is John Schwartzwelder. You will stop butchering his work. <laughs> okay, here he goes. Without Nelson, king of the bullies, the school would be overrun by rese- the resentful, touchy Millhouses, the narcissistic, intellectual Martin Princes, soft, chocolate gorging German children, <laughs> and infantile Ralph Wiggum. Muntz is a corrective. So, his point there is that bullying the weak is like, that's like another order of chaos order. symbiosis. It keeps that order. Sort of yin and yang, works man. out. Yeah. yeah. White masculine serpent. <laughs> it's like, so those things all have, those, all, those people, those, those children all have bad. Bad things about them. Mm-hmm. But the bad thing of being a sadist is nothing compared to being chocolate gorge <laughs> or intellectual. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Well, how does Jordan Peterson feel about the real life, uh, real life chocolate gorging German child, Kim.com? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last two rules here. These are, these are actually, to me, the ones I'm most interested in because I, I can't figure out what they mean. <laughs> Rule number 11 do not bother children when they are skateboarding. Now, this is a rule that, taken at face value, I 100% agree with. I you yeah. don't think I think kids should be allowed to skateboard whatever the fuck they want. I perform citizens' arrests of children <laughs> who skateboard all the time. I do think it's a crime. Uh, this I is lived, a really rambling, incoherent chapter. I don't know. I, yeah. I lived, for a while, I lived in an apartment building, and there was a fountain in front, and kids would do grinds off of it, uh-huh. and it was really annoyingly loud. Uh, I didn't yeah. like Old it. man Christmas. Here yeah. we go. This is the chapter where he goes in, all in on uh, postmodernism, and I completely can't remember. What does that remember. have to do with kids I cannot remember what it has to do with skateboarding at all. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so kids should be allowed. I, I think kids need more, a little bit more freedom, a little less supervision, a little bit more danger in everyday American life. That's generally yeah, sure. what I believe. Uh, rule 12. This is the final rule. And again, one that on face value I agree with entirely. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Get Parvo. I got allergies, man. I can't what, do what, it. What is he saying with this? Is it, is it, does he literally mean pet every cat you see? It's just, uh, you know, it's just stop and smell the roses cliches. It's not, okay. you know, yeah. it's... All right. Stop and smell yeah. the cats. Stop, yeah. you know, <laughs> sniff the cat's asshole. Yeah, you, you, when you see your friends, you know, taking out their shoes, suck, take some time, suck their toes, you know? <laughs> just enjoy life. So those are the 12 rules. And I guess just to to wrap it up here, I think, you know, I want to restate the most most salient fact about Jordan Peterson is how unbearably tedious he is as a writer and a thinker. However, the reason for his success and the fact that like this, again, pseudo philosophical drivel is having such a its moment in our culture right now is because, as we stated, like the oh, sort of hegemonic cultural lib- and political liberalism has largely failed. And for the young men that he's talking to, uh, nobody in like the overall like sort of monoculture is talking to them or addressing them. The only people who are talking to them is YouTube. Yeah. And he's talking to them through YouTube and he's telling them a story that, that makes sense or acknowledges some, some truths that aren't, being addressed or discussed elsewhere that they're not getting. And I'm not saying that he's right, but like he's, you know, like there's enough half truths and all of these things to lard the rest of it and add the rest of it out. And it, and it flatters prejudices that they already have. It doesn't really, it, cha- it challenges them in a superficial way in, in that they should clean their room or do some, you do know, some push ups or whatever. Uh, you know, stop gaming every four hours. Just or someone's whatever. paying attention. Yeah. Then. Right. Somebody's like, wants to make sure that they're doing okay. Yeah. But, but, in the deeper sense, they're absolutely, they're abs- he's absolutely flattering every lazy prejudice that they just got. From, like, uh, and I want to go a step culture. further because it's not just you know liberalism that has failed, but I think quite frankly the left has not done a good job or has failed in this regard of, for the most part, telling a story that connects with the lives or makes sense to most people. Yeah. And I mean, I, th- I think the story is being told. It just doesn't have the cultural... Spotlight. It doesn't have the outlet. There, there's really nobody doing it in a way that is accessible to people. Right. Can I pop in with yeah, my absolutely. soft take? This is producer Chris. By soft, the way. by the way, take. Yeah. Uh, so I was watching Queer Eye for the Straight Guy the other night, the new season, which is a very people are fun, loving it. Finally, people are loving it. It's connecting with a lot of people, and it occurred to me 
that the story that it's telling is, or what people take away from it is basically the same thing as what Jordan Peterson is offering, is that you have these young men who either, men of all ages who either ground too far into or somehow have jumped the track of like the society you're supposed to have. It's, it's dads who are working three jobs and only sleep three nights and because of their religious upbringing, married the first person they met and, and have five kids and they have no sense of self-identity or somebody who you know graduated and wasn't able to find work or place and is like unable to struggle in their work life and you have these people come in and crack open the door and show them a way out of this like prison of their constructed maleness in society uh that's liberatory in this way that that casts some kind of um story about taking control of your life having some kind of self-respect and putting shape on this chaotic, often, often literally like messy world, cleaning their rooms. And in this case, it's these gay men who are like showing their form of, of order in the chaos. And it's a more liberatory order. Again, it's like cracking the open this door and showing them a way out of, of these uh, prisons. Uh, and I just thought that it's such a, a positive mirror versus this kind of looking backwards uh, as you said, like reactionary, uh, f- embracing hierarchies thing. It's instead of saying clean your room so that you may embrace the order of classic systems. It's like like he, he's cracking open the door and saying like just be- become a prince in an ancient monarchy or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. or like, like crack open the door and bow down to your ancient rulers. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And bow I, down before, before yeah. the one you yeah. serve. Uh, yeah, I just thought that it's funny that these two things are resonating at the same time because they're very much the same thing of like order and chaos. And there is a place for like finding order because modern life is ext- incredibly chaotic and can, you can spiral out of control for no reason of your own doing and feel totally uh, out of control of your own life. But I would just say, uh, you know, get a facial scrub and like clean yourself up better and then maybe feel better instead of like embracing reactionary mindset about P- Pinocchio. And, and then- also there should be a sixth Fab Five who is the socialist Fab Five. Yeah, that's the <laughs> other thing is that you still is that is that the self-help thing is good to give you a sense that you're in charge of your life, but then you also need to have an understanding of why things are the way they are and how they could change. And that is where socialism comes in. Yeah, and that's what, and that's the other thing that's unexamined in the show, why I said there should be a six, is yeah. that the part of it is helicoptering in a $100,000 home makeover <laughs> yeah. that you know, helps, <laughs> helps redefine these people's lives, and it's, you know, it's really affecting... Uh, and like the other thing that I noticed is that Peterson does talk about. He has that thing about like hug your dad or something. Save your dad. Save your dad. Save your every dad. fuck your dad. <laughs> Almost every one of these uh, queer eye episodes has a moment where one of the guys turns to the subject and is like, "So I noticed you have a dad," <laughs> and the guy just starts bawling <laughs> oh, no. because they like either they have not let anybody talk to them about how they relate to their parents, or nobody has tried to, and it, just that like break in connection there that there's like a paper thin wall of emotion between them, and there even the concept of having a father is uh, I, another point of resonance that I thought. So yeah, yeah, I mean, like there's a reason why these things. Um you know, resonate with people on an, you know, an emotional level. And that's why I think I I was, you know, I was thinking about Pierce the other day and I felt like, you know, when I was in my twenties or earlier, like I I feel like sort of at an earlier, more embarrassing stage in my life, uh, like Christopher Hitchens sort of filled that role of like guy who I loved watching video clips of because I thought he was so smart. And like, I loved seeing him like parry a phrase and own people. And like, he's contrarian, he's challenging taboos. He seems like someone who has a systemic critique, even if he doesn't. Yeah. Right, right, and I was, just, and I was like, I, I, I love that. I, I was always, it was like the idea of being so impressed by how smart and cool like this guy was, and I think that's the way a lot of Peterson's fans respond to him because that, that, that he's this like, well, bearer of like, I mean, considering that he and, sounds like he somebody's caught his dick in a book, <laughs> I kind of can't under. I mean, he is to me. That's the one I have the hardest part getting is how he became a YouTube celebrity, sounding like that. And crying all the time. Have you seen the yeah, other yeah, YouTube it, celebrities? It, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess. It, it's, it, it's weird how some podcasts, like, just none of the hosts have good radio voices. Okay. It, they have the none most of us have good radio voices. On Patreon. But none of us. The show none isn't of particularly us, good. Uh, none of us sound <laughs> like just, we're, we're weeping Muppets. Yeah. I just want to come back to the... That's my real voice. The, uh, when I'm fucked up, that's the real me. I want to come back to the intellectual dark web concept. Yeah. Because uh, I'm just thinking about a a buddy of mine who uh, orders pharmaceutical drugs on the dark web. And uh, they come from just like guys who somehow get their hands on these chemicals and have fake molds of the actual pharmaceutical pills. 
and just pack them in there and then manufacture their own pills Ugh, and yeah. send it to you in the mail. And uh, that's just kind of what this book is, really. Yeah. <laughs> you mean convenient, great way to get ready for your big cross-country flight. Free market, it makes uh, your yeah. dick hard. Yeah, it makes your dick hard. <laughs> makes it easier for you to bust with your homies. <laughs> Um, rule, rule number 13, always bust with your homies. Hit the dab on them. You have to do it to them. <laughs> so um, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. this is our... Thank you, thank you, 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 you. you oh. can read my article on Peterson on uh, Viewpoint Magazine. We will we, link, oh. Even though I'm not Canadian, I'm Irish. Shuja, we will link to your article on Viewpoint um, in the episode description.